Welcome everyone uh, to our seminar today, uh, Brazil in the Age of Bolsonaro. We have an excellent panel to discuss many aspects of a country that's been very much in the news recently. Unfortunately, it's been for mostly bad reasons. COVID-19 pandemic, uh, rise in, in violence, particularly police violence recently in Rio de Janeiro. Of course, the Amazon and the concerns particularly within Europe over uh, deforestation and uh, unsustainable practices in terms of agriculture but also for the man who sits in Plan Alto. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro has become a controversial figure known as we all know as the tropical Trump uh, and has really represented in many ways uh, the idea of what could be a, a future challenge in terms of politics and global politics. And we have an excellent panel here to discuss and we're gonna kick it off with Richard Lapper uh, who not coincidentally just published a book on this very topic, um, Beef, Bible and Bullets. Uh, it is available, we'll be sending around the link. Uh, I'll also say with September 7th, Brazilian Independence Day coming up, it makes a great gift for your loved ones. Uh, it's also going to be coming out in Portugal, but it's out now. And I can say, having actually talked to Richard many times during the book, both of us during lockdown when he was writing, it, it's, it's more than just about Brazil. And it's more than even just about Jair Bolsonaro. It's about the age of politics today and society and the economic insecurity, the cultural wars, the fragmentation of civil society and the the social media echo, cha echo chamber that tends to generate uh, the level of populism and the repercussions that has not just in domestic politics, uh, but also in terms of economics and in terms of global engagement. And Brazil was a country under the Lula era uh, that sought to become a leader of the global South, sought to integrate itself into multilateral institutions as a way to project its power, has now taken a different course. Uh, and I think very much what uh, Richard describes in the book uh, is not just readable and exciting, it also demonstrates what is a long-term structural trend in Brazil that will not go away, whatever may happen in the 2022 elections, which we're also going to talk about. So before I give the floor over to Richard to talk about his book, uh, we have, after him, we'll have two panelists, uh, Adriana Abdenur, who is uh, the co-founder of the, uh, an executive director of Plataforma Cipo, and Arminia Fraga, Arminia Fraga, who is a former governor of the Central Bank, and is the co-partner and founding partner of Gavea uh, Investments. Uh, both of them will talk from their individual perspectives, uh, politics, in the other case, economics, uh, in Brazil in the age of Bolsonaro. Uh, and then before we start, two quick uh, things. The first is, this is uh, part of the Latin America Initiative at Chatham House, made possible by the generous support of BTG Bactuel, Vesneo, HSBC, Terran Energy, and Ecuador. And then in terms of uh, the protocol for um, Zoom, uh, when we have the discussion period, we'll be, Richard will talk for 10 minutes and then Arminio and Adriana for five to seven. We'll, uh, when, you, when you have a chance for questions, please uh, uh, raise your hand or uh, reach me in the chat function and I'll call on you and then you can unmute yourself. We'll be explaining that when the time comes. So uh, without further ado, Richard, uh, give us a sense, your book, uh, the anecdotes you have and your analysis of uh, Bolsonaro and, and the Bolsonarismo, if you will, uh, within Brazil. Thank you. And congratulations, uh, by the way. Thanks, Chris, uh, for those kind words. Uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in today. Um, so I'm gonna talk for, about the book for, for, for about three quarters of this 10 minutes lot. It's not just gonna be packing quite a bit in. And then I'll, I'll talk a bit about 2022 and, and the prospects ahead. I call the book Beef, Bible and Bullets for two reasons. First, uh, the, these are the names that are in Brazil are given to the congressional lobbies that support the president. Um, but I've used the terms in more broadly, as it were, as figures of speech, if you like, for the social groups from which the president draws his most passionate support. Uh, beef refers to the agro lobby, self-evidently, that, that has broadly wanted to make environmental controls more flexible and has pushed a whole series of other demands, including the right to, for, to use guns to defend their properties, for example. It, it's a complex block, and far from united, um, over the last 20 years, some of the bigger uh, and wealthier farmers and agribusiness interests have wised up and support sustainable farming methods, at least on paper, um, not least because they know they've got to do that if they were to retain access to international markets. However, there are many people in rural Brazil, especially in the more remote corners of the Amazon, that really just want to be left alone to farm to mine, to log. Um, these are interests that tend to see environmental controls as something imposed by unresponsive bureaucrats 
at the behest of distant international interests. When I was researching the book, I visited the state of Horaima in the north of Brazil, which voted very heavily in favor of Bolsonaro, and I met many people who argued along these lines. Bible refers to socially conservative Christians who rail against progressive social legislation and particularly incensed or have been incensed by efforts to introduce things like sex education classes in schools or make homophobia illegal. Uh, many Catholics in Brazil think like this, but the people who really identify with Bolsonaro's intemperate attacks on gays, so-called gender ideology and political correctness are evangelical Protestants and especially members of Brazil's homegrown neo-Pentecostal churches. The thing to remember about Protestantism in Brazil is that it's growing like topsy. Just to give you some figures here, 1980, about 6.6% of Brazilians, 8 million people at the time, were considered themselves Protestants. By 2010, the number had gone up to 42.3 million, just over a fifth of the population. Now it's nearer 31%, according to the most recent polls. And it's the more conservative Pentecostals that are growing most quickly. They're particularly strong in poorer and more marginal communities. In the book, I spent quite a bit of time in a place called Gloria, a poor suburb of Uberlandia, a city in the state of Minas Gerais. It's home to about 700,000 people. Gloria is a squatter settlement originally. It's existed for only 10 years. There are 2,000 homes there. When I was there at the beginning of 2020, there were no fewer than 22 Protestant churches. They were growing at the rate of two a year. Finally, bullets. A lot of people in Brazil support a crackdown on organized crime and want the police to have more power simply to shoot members of drug scams. During the period 2015 to 18, ahead of the last election, popular anxieties about violent crime grew tremendously. I argue in the book that this was at least partially because of a war between two of the country's largest criminal organizations, the First Command of the Capital from Sao Paulo and Red Command from Rio. This war brought death rates to very high levels in a number of Brazilian states. I visit one of them in the book, uh, Serra in the Northeast. I spent a, quite a bit of time going around Fortaleza looking at the impact of that in poor communities. Now, Bolsonaro's shoot to kill approach um, also won him support among the country's military police, the largest of the country's police forces. Rank and file police officers tend to be fans of Bolsonaro and his ideas. Uh, Bolsonaro enjoys firm support in, uh, in the army, not least because many soldiers have benefited from government jobs. According to some accounts, there are now as many military officers in government positions as there were during the 20 year long military dictatorship that began in the mid 1960s. So this is the base of Bolsonaro's more radical support, social conservatives, small farmers, right wing policemen who are opposed to liberalism, whether it comes in the form of demands for tighter environmental controls, a more humane approach towards crime and criminals, and a more tolerant approach towards homosexuality. Some people say about a quarter of a population espouse these radical hard right opinions. Some say it's nearer 15%. The fact of the matter is that Bolsonaro probably wouldn't have won the election in 2018 if he just obtained votes from the radical right. His appeal then was much broader because he was seen as a viable alternative to the PT, the Workers' Party, which held the presidency in Brazil between 2003 and 16, and who, when they lost office, were widely blamed for the economic mismanagement that led to the recession in 2015 and the corruption scandals exposed by the car wash investigation. So in 2018, a lot of conservatives, liberal and more traditional, as well as the radical right, voted for Bolsonaro. They liked the fact that it invited Sergio Moro, the investigating judge who had led the car wash probe into his government. They applauded Bolsonaro's promises to introduce liberal economic reforms. Quite a bit has changed since then. Um, in fact, the story of the Bolsonaro government since the beginning of 2019 has been a story of constant friction between the radical right-wing base and Bolsonaro's liberal conservative allies. The alliance is just about intact, 
but much, much weaker than it was. And one of, the, one of the main reasons for that weakness is the government's idiosyncratic management of the coronavirus pandemic. So from the outset, Bolsonaro has been a denialist. He's minimized the impact of the disease. He's opposed quarantines and social distancing measures. He's criticized bitterly state governors and mayors who've introduced restrictions and threatened judges who've upheld the rights of local leaders to take action. He's broken with governors such as Juan Doria from Sao Paulo, who supported him in 2018. He's promoted unproven early remedies such as chloroquine and Invermectin. And he sacked health ministers who refused to go along with that. Bolsonaro has been incredibly slow to roll out vaccines certainly in the first few months after they, were, after they were discovered, not least because of his own skepticism about jobs. This is a leader who wants to claim publicly that the Pfizer vaccine might turn him into an alligator. Now, not surprisingly, the pandemic has exacted a heavy toll in Brazil. Death rates been rising from 500 a day in December to 1,000 a day in January, February, and at least 2,000 a day since then. And as the number of cases rise, the number of COVID variants multiply. Brazil's health infrastructures come under huge pressure. Even the private hospitals that wealthy Brazilians use have run short of materials and beds. And in March, 1,500 economists, businessmen, all manner of opinions signed a letter attacking the government's approach to the pandemic and demanding change. The controversies surrounding COVID left Bolsonaro exposed in Congress and potentially subject to impeachment proceedings. Now, his response to that has brought about an important shift in the political scene. To explain that, I've got to backtrack a little bit. Bolsonaro has been a member of several parties uh, since he was first elected to Congress in 1990. He fought the election for a small, hitherto little-known right-wing party known as the Social Liberals. He soon left that party. He's talked about forming a new one. It's come to nothing. But in many ways, his campaign was anti-political, anti-party. He decried the traditional, frequently corrupt give and take of congressional politics. He rode the wave of lavajato enthusiasm, popular lavajato enthusiasm of this period. Um, and now in response to the potential action by congressional opponents, Bolsonaro turned, turned, um, turned direction 180, but not, he's, he's completely changed direction. He's got together in the middle of last year with a number of small right-wing parties, centre-right parties, known collectively as the Big Centre or the Centre Out. Their main goal in political life is not to put, any, put in place any particular set of policies, but simply to enjoy the material fruits of political office. These are some of the most physiological parties as they're known in Brazil. They were hugely associated with the kind of corruption that was exposed by the Carwash investigation. So now instead of an alliance between beef, the beef Bible and bullets crowd and liberal conservatives, we have an alliance between the radical right and the pragmatists of the Centro. Um, Bolsonaro's promise, which was always pretty fanciful of a new kind of politics has evaporated. The car wash investigation is over. Sergio Moro left the government in April last year. Several rulings since then have discredited his role in the inquiry. Former President Lula is back in the game and participating in next year's election, despite his alleged role in corruption in the past, he's free to take part. Now, where do we go from here? I've got very little time left. Bolsonaro's alliance with the Central is providing some very precarious stability. COVID infection and death rates are high. Brazil is finally slowly rolling out its vaccine program. Commodity prices are high. The economy is growing, 5% expansion likely this year. There's been some reform, may not be very important in terms of long-term long growth, in, but, the, but, but there, has been, there has been some movement. Electrobras is going to be sold off, or bits of it at least. Bolsonaro still counts with the backing the BBB crowd, uh, the Beef Bullets and Bible, but they're still with him. He's unpopular, though, amongst everyone else. The recovery has been accompanied by rising inflation and very high levels of unemployment. So there's no, what you would describe, a feel-good factor in Brazil. Recent polls, and this has been a pattern since March, suggest that he would lose an election to Lula by 
really by a landslide. The distance between Lula and Bolsonaro is between 10 and 20 percentage points. The most recent poll last week suggested that Lula could win the election in the first round. So many people, moderates on all sides, many in the private sector are very unhappy about the options. So far, no one has been able to come up with a third candidate who could stem what is evidently polarization between the radical right and the whatever Lula represents these days. I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I feel I'm almost obliged to point out that there is a bit of coup speculation at the moment because a lot of people in the armed forces and the military police do not like Lula and simply don't accept that he was not guilty of corruption. So I've heard it suggested by many quite sober commentators that if Bolsonaro loses next year's election, he would resort to force to retain office. Now, perhaps on balance, this will not happen because maybe the economic rev revival will gather some pace and that might play well for Bolsonaro's election prospects. Perhaps Brazil's relatively solid institutions will defuse the risk of a constitutional crisis. But what I do want to say is that Brazil faces a very uncertain year ahead. Thanks. Thank you very much, Richard, for a very interesting summary, uh, very compelling as well. Uh, it certainly leaves us off with uh, lots of things to talk about. Uh, and I'm going to start with Adriana. Um, and, and I want to sort of highlight two of the things that Richard mentioned. One is, is you know, can the center hold? Uh, and I, by that, I don't mean the central, but the actual political center between Lula and Bolsonaro, and is it that stark? And the second is, is without getting into the world of, of predictions on, on coups or, or what have you, you know, have institutions been damaged in any way that will, they can't be recovered or that would last over the long term or could sort of fail in this capacity to mediate political disputes? So Adriana, over to you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to this debate. Uh, Richard, I haven't yet read your book, but I've read about it and I look forward to, to reading it. It looks like a great overview. And for those of us here in Brazil, it's very useful to have another perspective on this mayhem that we're still living through. Um, I'm going to speak briefly from the perspective of civil society. I co-founded um, a policy research institute at the beginning of the pandemic, so we exist virtually, but we have staff in five different biomes around Brazil and also uh, abroad. And from our perspective, um, it, there's a false dichotomy when we ask our institutions still working or not, but we definitely live through the declining quality of democracy in Brazil, the shrinking spaces for participation and even attempts to uh, criminalize uh, those of us in civil society, especially working as our organization does on environmental and climate uh, matters. So I'm going to make a few statements that hopefully complement um, Richard's uh, broad overview, again, focusing on our work, which is um, mostly on illegal deforestation and other environmental crimes in the Amazon. And we have been analyzing not only internal dynamics, mapping out the national actors who are relevant to combating and prevention of environmental crimes, but also how foreign policy um, ties into this. And these topics may not be the most directly relevant in terms of public opinion. For instance, foreign policy very, very seldom becomes a, a hot button issue in presidential elections in Brazil. It's still viewed very much as an external, almost niche type uh, topic. But uh, it does come in indirectly, for instance, through the emphasis or not on commodity exports and trade relations. And of course, the environmental issue, which has never been very central to presidential campaigns, maybe with the exception of uh, Marina da Silva, uh, it has now become very much a, a, a subject of interest, not only among foreign actors, but also increasingly here in Brazil. So what we can say is that the, the government's behavior with respect to environmental and climate issues is really symptomatic of something which I believe Richard has put in his book, which is the, the fact that Bolsonaro tends to offer a very seductive um, solution or, or view of public 
problems and their solutions by simply simplifying them or you know offering simplistic um, solutions. And the way that he does this, and we, we, we see this very much in the environmental area, is by undermining systems of knowledge that are based on data and analysis, and uh, broadly, broadly put, you would say logic. And um, the use of fake news, but also an appeal to almost like a cosmogony, to go back to old philosophy, is very evident across all sectors, but I think is particularly felt right now in the environmental um, area. We're going, we're experiencing new uh, record levels of illegal deforestation. The data just came out from the National Space Institute for the month of May. It's the highest ever since the data series began to be collected. Um, and it represents an increase of 40% over the same period last year. So we really are living through a period of not just pandemic crisis, but the su superimposition of this ecological and socio-ecological crisis. And of course, this has bearing on the, the, the arrangement of the blocks that uh, Richard mentioned within Congress, but also I think are major factors that will continue to influence the basket of risks that we call Risco Brasil, non Brazil risk. Um, what, what has been the government's approach, if you can call it that? First of all, what we see, and we have a report that was just published, and I'll share with you the link um, in the chat a little bit later, is a policy of dismantling. Um, it's a dismantling of the federal institutions that are in charge of protection of the environment, but also of the traditional peoples that inhabit it, the forested areas, including indigenous and the Afro-descending, the Quilombola peoples. And this is done not just through budget cuts. So we're not just talking about, you know, the minimal state. We're really talking about um, uh, exclusion of personnel and dismantling of the basic structures that have uh, over the years accumulated a lot of know-how, a lot of know-how and, and expertise about how to monitor the environment and respond to it. Mm -hmm. And of course, the response has always been a very mixed response by state actors, armed forces sometimes, prosecutors, sometimes in collaboration with civil society and even the private sector. And it's important to know that the only period we've had in which we had a, a significant decrease in illegal forestation was precisely when a deal was struck between the state, state actors, especially through the prosecutors and the private sector. And even though ESG is now very much at the forefront of conversation, what we know from this area is that unless you have a federal level vision of development that is compatible with keeping the forest standing, um, the, the private sector tends to find the path of least resistance. And even when you have this external pressure, that's not enough to curb deforestation because there are many loopholes and uh, ways to, to go about uh, making a profit out of products in the forest. So what we see is that illegal land invasions Illegal mining and illegal logging especially are skyrocketing, especially in the um, protected lands, the indigenous lands and the conservation units. And this is not just a result of this dismantling policy, it's also a direct consequence of an official discourse that openly encourages these activities. So when Bolsonaro says that you know Brazil will not have any more environmental crimes, what he's referring to is that if you legalize environmental crimes, then they no longer constitute crimes. And, uh, and it's a very open uh, way to put it. This line of thinking, by the way, is not completely new. Um, it has even been present in some of the left-wing governments that also viewed um, the Amazon as this vast, interminable uh, place of resource. But it's being distilled and taken to an extreme that we really have not witnessed since um, the 1970s. Uh, when we had the military dictatorship. And then at the same time, and I think this is probably um, the second most important component of the environmental policy, is a type of fire hosing of legal bills that are intended to, um, to legalize the environmental crimes. And we, you know, those of us in civil society, we work as networks because um, there are so many of these legal bills that are put forth every single day that you have to follow them and come up with collective strategies to try to resist the most damage causing ones. But there are many that end up falling through the cracks. And again, they dismantle the structures that are in place. And the third 
a pillar of this approach, in addition to the dismantling and the fire hosing of legal bills, is the militarization of environmental preservation, right? So part of the seductive logic of the Bolsonaro government, and again, it's not something new, but it's something that it brings back with, with force, is the belief that the armed forces will come in and they will solve our problems. And this continues to happen, even though previous attempts showed that militarizing environmental preservation is A, extremely costly. So the last operation, it um, cost more than the entire environmental budget that had been set aside by the Bolsonaro government. And yet it does not yield results. In fact, it may yield some negative results. But again, politically, just as encouraging environmental crimes panders to the beef base, which Richard mentions, militarizing any aspect of the public sphere, in this case, environmental preservation, uh, bolsters his support base among the military, right? Which along with the beef and the evangelicals constitute still the main, um, the main support base for, for Bolsonaro. So in terms of the relevance to the election, in, in addition to pandering to the bancada ruralista, right, the agribusiness interest, because we have to remember that the encroachment on these protected areas is driven. It's not by the, the guys and who the families in the Amazon who are seeking out a living. These people exist, but what's driving this is big money. It's high level organization. It's levels of sophistication that include um, hacking into satellites, that include using um, cryptocurrencies. So that is where the driving force is. We have to look at the politics, the money, and the level of organization rather than the discourse. I uh, can't buy into this discourse that it's just these people in the Amazon that have to earn a living. Obviously, jobs are needed in the in, in the, the region. But what's happening is that you have money coming in from Sao Paulo, you have money coming in from Curitiba, probably from Rio de Janeiro, where I am, and, and helping to, to perpetuate and intensify um, these uh, dynamics. And okay, let's, let's leave it there. We have, we have to move on to Arminio. Plenty of time in the question and answer period. Um, Arminio, um, the, uh, obviously uh, Brazil took a large hit in the economy, negative 4.1% growth in 2020, but back on the road to growth, uh, thanks in large part to the uh, commodities. And of course, uh, the, the blow that was cushioned uh, by uh, the fiscal stimulus. Uh, what is your sense of the economic uh, conditions generally uh, and the economic future of Brazil? Thank you. Um, uh, like those who came, spoke before me, uh, Richard, congratulations. I can't think uh, of someone uh, more qualified uh, to uh, to write such a book. Uh, I look forward to reading. I've, I've flipped it in figuratively on on Kindle, and I look forward to uh, to reading it. Um, look, uh, I'm going to give you a quick uh, view, kind of leaning uh, towards the economic side of things, which is sort of where I, where where I'm more comfortable. But but I'll I'll, I'll go outside that a little bit. First point I'd like to, uh, to highlight is that um, uh, even before Bolsonaro, and, and, and my view of Bolsonaro's government is, is like the ones who just spoke. It's just an, an amazing uh, disaster. Uh, but uh, even before he came along, uh, Brazil hadn't really been doing that well. We've had some good moments after the, the so-called lost decade. Uh, but overall, I was looking at some numbers. I, I put out a piece uh, yesterday in the photo of Sao Paulo. Even if you exclude the last decade, if you look from then on, including Cardozo, including the, the good years of Lula, there was some, some, some not so good years as well. Uh, but we're still, Brazil still only managed to grow a little bit over 1% on a per capita basis during these years. So Brazil is not converging. In fact, pretty much all of Latin America at this point is, is in that uh, uh, sad situation. And things have become uh, more fragile. Even before Bolsonaro came along, we had serious macroeconomic problems. It's been a, a recurrent problem of ours over the years. Um, we had uh, 
the low growth, which points towards productivity issues all over. And I, 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 I don't have time to get into that. We also had, despite some uh, improvement uh, during the Cardozo and, and Lula years, massive inequality issues, uh, both as far as basic poverty is concerned, but also looking beyond that, uh, there's been very low social mobility. I'm joining Adriana in the civil third sector um, uh, in, in, in that area. We have a, a brand new institute uh, up and running, focusing on social mobility. Uh, and then fourth, so macro productivity, inequality, and then the politics. And by, by that, what, what do I mean? It's basically, uh, it's simple. It's just, how come we really haven't been able to uh, get our act together to do more? You know, why are we stuck? Um, and, and into this comes Bolsonaro and, and, and it's, it's quite a, 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 an amazing situation. He um, was elected on the back of the sort of Moro Geddes approach uh, and everything that, that has already been said. Uh, but for the most part, he quickly showed what he was all about. And what he's all about in the end is, is not to continue with a reform agenda, um, but rather to, um, to put Brazil on a, on a path that we now understand well from the work of many political scientists over the last few years of a sort of a slow motion uh, coup. Um, and I think this is very, very serious stuff. Um, and but we'll have to see where this goes, but it, it, it entails more than the more visible symptoms. I mean, when, when, when any one of us utters the word Brazil right now, most people around the planet think Amazon. Um, they now also know about the pandemic fiasco. They don't know what the Bolsonaro government is doing, for instance, in the world of weapons and ammunition, pretty much uh, has become a free for all. Um, they don't know uh, really what the, the real situation of the economy is. The 5% growth for this year is basically a statistical uh, a figment. Uh, it's, it's a recovery uh, driven by a lot of government spending, which fine, it, was, it had to be done, but into a backdrop of an already very fragile uh, situation. Um, and we see um, all of a sudden, you know, the water is boiling down here. Like Adriana, I'm also in Rio. Um, and, 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 and it is a, a very tense moment. We are very much afraid of a repeat of what happened uh, last time uh, in 2018. There was a moment before the, the, the voting took place in October where the top two uh, leading uh, candidates, uh, uh, Haddad from the PT and Bolsonaro, uh, in uh, simulations for a runoff, were beaten by the next three in every permutation. This is pretty amazing. And we had that. So we're worried that this could happen again. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm not sure where this is going to end up. Uh, at this point, uh, there is a, a clear demand on the part of um, you know, people who are following, folks who are reading the newspapers uh, and following what's going on. I'm not sure you know, um, how far this uh, reaches uh, the, the Brazilian population, but there's a hope that something will happen and um, a non-extreme uh, solution will take place. But uh, we just uh, we just don't know. I don't feel the economy will be a plus. Besides the the possibility of of a, of a recovery driven by a late surge in vaccination, hopefully will happen. Of course, I I think there's a lack of confidence that is paralyzing. So I don't think the economy will bail out uh, Bolsonaro. Um, and um, beyond that. Um, Oh, everything is up for grabs. So I'll stop here. Um, happy to answer any questions um, 
delighted to be here uh, with you all. Great, thank you, Arminio. Um, I'm gonna, we have already a few people with their hands raised. I just wanna ask you one quick follow-up question, which is uh, the structural uh, um, conditions of the economy. We're already seeing an uptick because of uh, commodity demand from China. Um, how, how, how much room is there for potential in that growth? And is that somewhat limited? Uh, and only to, rec to where Brazil no. was pre-pandemic, no. we actually agree that. There is some room. But the traditional macro policy instruments um, are no longer available. Rates are actually, rates are going up uh, um, and there's hardly any room left for fiscal policy. There'll be a little bit for next year driven by the fact that inflation um, uh, allows for, for that, but uh, I don't think that's any reason to celebrate. And so we're looking at the private sector as the, as the uh, locomotive and I, I think this, the lack of confidence is, is a, a, a very strong limiting factor. Investment in Brazil is, is probably, a, 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 as a you know, portion of GDP, is at the lowest ever. Um, and it's interesting, if I may, one more second. Um, if you look at the last, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years, government spending has grown by at least 10 points of GDP. I'm looking now at the... Uh, federal, state, and local. Um, but public investment has gone down from 5% of GDP to 1% of GDP. So just think of this, massive growth in government spending, a collapse in government investment. We just don't have our act together. And, and th this is not a growth inspiring um, environment, I'm afraid. Well, thank you. Uh, so please raise your hands uh, now, I, and then I'm going to call on you. Uh, Melanie Avila, you have a question. Please unmute yourself, introduce um, yourself, and ask for Hi, can everyone hear me? Yep. Like hi, what the Haji? I have a question. So I would like to ask, what are the long-term repercussions of the growing militarization of the public space and of social and environmental issues post Bolsonaro? Thank you. Richard, let's go with you first. You're, you're so I didn't quite catch that issues. question. What are the long-term issues? Of a militarization of the public space. Well, look, I mean, I, mean, I think the, the, the problem is, um, the problem is this, um, and it is summed up um, a couple of weeks ago, when uh, it's the politicization of the military that's the problem, uh, rather than the, uh, even more than the military entering the public space. I mean, and... The problem is summed up when Pazuelo, the former Minister of Health, participated in a demonstration alongside Bolsonaro at the end of May. Uh, he was a, he's, a, he's an acting military officer and he was in clear breach of military rules. And um, the high command uh, considered the matter uh, and they should have imposed, um, they should have punished him for that. Uh, but they have absorbed him from any 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 wrongdoing. Now that's they're under a lot of pressure to do that from Bolsonaro. But the danger is that if such, if that kind of activity became normal, it will will encourage that that kind of encourages other soldiers and policemen who, as I've said, uh, tend to be sympathetic to Bolsonaro. It encourages them to be politically active. This is very dangerous. And I think that, um, you know, when Bolsonaro talks about the army, he talks about my army. Um, there is some resistance in the high command to this, but this is a very dangerous trend. And, you know, the politicization, the conversion of what some people say would be into a Praetorian guard would be a, a real problem for Brazil. Um, and, you know, it does make you think, you know, something in Brazil were to happen as happened in the United States in January, you know, when supporters of President Trump, you know, invaded the Congress building, you know, they were, there was some opposition from the US police force. Now, would that happen in Brazil? You know, with a, a, a you know, you can well, and you can well expect in a way, uh, the Brazilian security forces to stand around if that was to happen with their arms folded. This is quite dangerous if the, if the, um, if the armed forces become so explicitly political. Adriana, you're, you mentioned the issue of militarization of environmental policy. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? 
Uh, thank you for the question. So I think in addition to the risks of uh, politicization of the military, which Richard has already mentioned, I do think it's also ex extremely problematic to see the militarization of different spheres. I mentioned the environmental area, but public security as well. And this is a long-term trend in different parts of Latin America. The problem is that the logic of militarization says that if you militarize and it's not working, you just have to militarize it more. So, you know, this is the mano dura approach, the hard handed approach. Um, and it means, for instance, flooding um, guns and armaments um, and saying, well, if it's not yet, you know, curbing organized crime, it's just because we have to be even harsher. And politically, it's a very seductive argument, especially for the middle classes and upper classes who are kind of um, you know, locked away in their in their condominiums. But ultimately, what this does, whether we're talking about public security or the environment, is it undermines expertise and the use of expertise to design and implement effective policy making. Because again, the training of the military. I used to teach at one of the military academies. Uh, the training of the military is not geared towards public security. It's not geared towards the environment. And so that's a misuse of a public resource. And it often leads to their corruption. Yes, and Arminio, I, was yes. gonna, I didn't know whether to ask you a question on this topic, please. No, I just, um, I, I, it's, I don't have an optimistic view on this, but maybe, uh, maybe something uh, along the following lines will help us in the end. I suspect that the military, uh, at least at the, the, the higher echelons, have at this point figured out that if they were to support a, a, an authoritarian uh, adventure beyond the one that's already taking place, mind you, uh, but an authoritarian, I think they know they would be uh, kind of rolling back to the Titanic, if you will. I think they, 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 they must know that this is, this is, is a disaster. Um, so that's kind of the only hope I have um, on, on, on this front. Um, we'll see. People are figuring this out. I think this recent uh, event that uh, Richard alluded to uh, regarding uh, corruption in the world of vaccines uh, seems quite serious. There's enough out there that I think in the end we, we can um, avoid the you know, a, a total collapse uh, of our democracy. It, it is being threatened, that there's no question. And that is of course in turn affecting the economy. Also no question about that. Will we in the end, at the end of the day, uh, collapse? Um, I, I, I still have high hopes we won't. I think it will be tough, uh, but that's how I see it. One quick point of clarification, I mean, you know, in, in sort of the, the the militarization that others have spoken of. Um, there's been no news about the military becoming uh, re-involved, if you will, in, econo in the economy as it was in the 20 year plus uh, military regime. I, I assume that's still the case. That, I mean, the news is, seems to be markets are still functioning. The, the time of sort of the military industrial complex, if you will, of, of Brazil is, is in the past. Is that right? Yes, I think that's, that, that's generally right. Um, Bolsonaro has opposed uh, reform attempts by his economy minister. Um, but I wouldn't blame the military on that. Um, I think they're there. They were, were dragged into this. I probably think they, I suspect they thought, okay, you know, Brazil needs a little bit of technocracy. But by now, I, I'm pretty sure I have reasons to think they've figured this one out. They, 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 yeah. They're not going to do this. Yeah. There could be noise. I, I, I can't rule that out, uh, but uh, I, I stand by my uh, okay, Good. my prediction and, and my hope. Good. We have, I'm going to take the next set of questions together. So we have Peter Goodman. So Peter, get ready to unmute yourself. Antonio Sampao, uh, Baroness Hooper, and then Elena Lazaru. And we'll go in that order. So Peter, uh, introduce yourself. Uh, unmute yourself first. Introduce yourself and please ask your question. Sure. Thanks. Uh, it's Peter Goodman. I'm the global economic correspondent at the New York Times. Uh, thanks for taking my question. I just want to follow up on what Armenia was saying uh, right at the end there 
about uh, public spending being up uh, very significantly while investment is actually down. What sort of time frame are we talking about and where's the money gone? Okay, hold on to that thought. I mean, we're going to take these all together uh, and I'm avoiding a temptation to add a question to Peter, so, but I won't. Antonio, please ask a question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Richard, congratulations on the book. Antonio Sampaio, uh, formerly at the IISS when, when we met and now at the Global Initiative Against Transnational <laughs> Organized Crime. Um, my question is, uh, Richard, in your view, what, um, what is behind the complete meltdown of the center in Brazil? I mean, uh, it was mentioned at the beginning of the, the event that the, will the center hold? I think, I think it's pretty clear that the center is not, not only not holding, but it's completely destroyed at the moment. Um, so, so in your view, what, what is behind this um, um, complete sort of withdrawal of, of centrist voices, especially from the PSDB, for instance, Doria, Doria's candidacy was, was, was seen as, as, as likely, but now, you know, he, he, he's failing to, to gain any momentum. And, and if I, if I may, uh, a quick question to Adriana as well. Um, Adriana, how, how, uh, how significant do, do you think the damage by Bolsonaro on institutions like Ibama and other uh, environmental protection agencies has been? And by that, I mean, how reversible and how quickly reversible would that be if, uh, if a more sort of pragmatic government sort of took over in, in after, after Bolsonaro? Thank you. Thank you, very good. Um, Baroness Hooper, please. Uh, hello, thank you. And um, first of all, thanks to all the presenters. And my question, I think, is directed mainly to Richard. Um, uh, hello, Richard. Um, hello. And, and congratulations on the book. Um, in the past, I've always regarded individual state governors as having considerable power. It doesn't seem to be working out under the present regime. But as between the various states, um, is the one who would possibly be a future presidential candidate, even if it's not for the next elections, but uh, in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, very good question. And last, uh, Elena Lazarou, uh, the uh, EU Parliament and also an Associate Fellow of Chatham House, as is Richard. Thank Elena. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Nice to see all these familiar faces. I'm also associate of FGV still. Um, so I have two quick questions for, for Richard, I guess, but for anyone else who wants to jump in. Uh, first is, you know, part of Bolsonaro's appeal to his Bullets and Bible supporters was alignment with Trump, this narrative of return to the West of Brazil. And I was wondering uh, if, if you could speak a bit more about how Biden's election has changed that picture and if Lula can capitalize on this, looking to 2022 so that the fact that Bolsonaro can no longer offer this narrative with the changing politics in the US. And perhaps the second question to all the speakers is how would a, a new Lula uh, government differ from the old Lula that we know and what would we expect to see different given also the politics that have happened in between, the different constituencies that have voted for Bolsonaro, uh, but also the post-corona environment. Fantastic. Thank you. So quickly, um, we're going to go in reverse order. So we end with the uh, man of the hour, Richard Lapper. But basically, public investment, to what extent, and this is to you, Arminio, is that, gonna, is that affecting economic growth? And, that, and I would add to the question, to the question, what is the risk that that will increase by Bolsonaro as we head into the 2022 elections? What will be obviously a, a very difficult election for him? Second is the meltdown of the center. Um, and the third is um, how reversible, this is to you, Adriana, how reversible is the military, the encroachments of the military in institutional and political life. Um, fourth are the governors, uh, to what, what has happened with uh, Brazil's very uh, robust federal system, and are there any uh, rising governors? Uh, and then last, Elena's two questions. Um, we usually only allow one question per customer, but this time she's a fellow, um, is... Um, you know, is it possible that, that, you know, that sort of the moment has passed Bolsonaro by given the Biden election, how is he going to re and then what could be um, uh, a Lula 2.0 government, what would that look like? So Adriana, let's, uh, I'm sorry, Arminio, let's start with you. Okay, um, so the, the issue of where the money gone is, um, uh, is an important one. We've had substantial growth in, in, in government spending. Um, 
And we ended up with uh, the following situation, 80% of government spending, non-financial non spending uh, in Brazil goes to social security and uh, payroll. This is a total outlier of a number. Um, and I'm not defending, I'm not a defender of the minim, minimum state, none of that stuff. But, but Brazil, if you, if you look at the numbers, is completely uh, out of any curve, particularly for a middle income country. So Brazil will have to address these issues. There's been some social security reform, they'll probably have to do more. Um, and um, we'll have to see and on top of that. And this comes from uh, also, you know, social democratic governments uh, 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 such as Cardozo and Lula, we also have uh, a lot of subsidies out there that uh, in the end end up in the pockets of, of those who need it the least. So we have three blocks that are very large and that suck all the money out of where it ought to be going to the public health system that has been heroic in its efforts to um, um, education, to infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So a, a quick comment on Lula, and I'll get out of the way. Um, see, I, it's important that people realize that there's Lula point one, that was um, uh, until 2006. Then there's Lula point two, that shifted uh, 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 gears. Uh, and, and then if he wins, there will be Lula point three. Um, and we just don't know whether he's Lula point one or point two and, uh, you know, how things are going to work out. Um, and this is just in the economic sphere. There are all the other political issues, corruption and so on um, before us. But, yeah. you know, on the economic sphere, we hope we see Lula point one back. That's for sure. Uh, and uh, I would suspect that's what he's going to try to uh, convey uh, to the electorate here in Brazil and to the elites who, who backed him up, uh, uh, including his passing of the baton to Dilma, which was, as we now know, catastrophic. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's that. Thank you. Thank you, Arminio. Uh, Adriana, um, a number of questions for you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so Antonio Aston, damage to Obama, and yes, it's very serious and especially to Instituto Chico Mendes, ICMBO. Um, is it reversible? Yes, but it will take a very long time because again, what Bolsonaro is doing is he's not just slashing budgets. He's really um, destructuring the entire thing. And it takes a long time to hire. It takes a long time to train people. And it takes an even longer time to rebuild the ties of trust, not only among the staff, but also with other sectors, again, without which environmental protection is, is almost impossible. Um, Elena, uh, you asked about the alignment with Trump. So I think Biden's election was not the major change. The previous um, uh, chancellor, Ernesto Toraujo, who was really a, a lunatic, I mean, he really looked to the crusades against the Saracens as a model for, you know, for reality in Brazil. Um, he's been replaced by a diplomat who, who appears to kind of be, have a more institutional line. Brazil has been elected to a non-permanent seat at the UN Security Council. But that change was more due to the attacks of the Bolsonaro family on China and indirect pressures that were also placed by Chinese actors. So it was that was the real, uh, if not a turning, I wouldn't call it a turning point, but I would say that the tone has softened and the paranoia that infused foreign policy when Araujo was there, he really relied on the aesthetics of the extreme right and um, you know, hearkening back even to the Nazi period um, has not uh, been given so much visibility. But um, if Lula capitalized this looking to 2022, I mean, I think Lula's foreign policy would be completely different. It was historically, and I don't see why it would change. And then finally, on how a new Lula government would uh, come under new pressures, I think Lula would come under 
a lot of new pressures on the environmental front. We have to remember that the Workers' Party was the biggest champion of the Belo Monte Dam, which has the single biggest environmental impact in the entire Amazon. So even the left, the Workers' Party, has had a view of the Amazon that is not very friendly to the indigenous population and to other traditional peoples. And I think as a backlash to what's happening now, uh, those constituencies are better organized and better e able to influence policy at the federal level when a new government come in. We're not going to see any changes, even with a new minister of the environment. I'll stop there. Thank you, Adriana. I just wanted to tell everyone this is on the record. I think even including Adriana's term for the uh, former foreign minister is a complete lunatic. I'm totally fine. I'm willing Keep to stand by that. Okay, good. I just want to yes, make sure. Yes. So everything is on the record. This is not under the Chatham House rule. Uh, and I also like those terms of tactical uh, phrases that you use. Um, and then last, uh, Richard, you have a number of questions that are on your, your plate here. Um, the meltdown of the center, again, the military, and I think it goes to the long term. And what's happened to the governors that Baroness Hooper mentioned? Are they, is this still yeah. a test tube for new leadership? Are they, what about their, their carved out institutional prerogatives? No, so I think... I think there are some threads running through this in terms of the centre and its difficulties. I mean, first, most evidently, I mean, the centre, the, the big centre parties, the PMDB and the PSDB, were damaged by the sort of political implosion of La Vigiato, really, um, particularly the PMDB. Um, you know, you look at the, the voting numbers between 2010 and 2018, and, and there's a very, very substantial fall in support for both those parties. They were really bulwarks of the Brazilian political system, um, you know, in the, in the whole period since the return to democracy, and, they, and they, they've, they've struggled very badly. Now, I think, you know, association with La Vigiato, um, uh, particularly in the case of the PMDB, was one of the reasons for that. Um, and it's for example, you know, Michel Temer, who was in some ways quite a successful president, this introduced some very good legislation, but he was an extremely unpopular president. Um, and it, at, at various points in his presidency, his popularity ratings were lower than those of, uh, of Dilma Rousseff, and he survived impeachment efforts uh, against him. So I think, you know, it's hard to separate off that sort of whole Lava Jato wave, really. Um, and that, that's a whole different discussion, you know, where Lava Jato went wrong and what happened in the first phase when it was extremely popular and the second phase when, you know, they began to focus on Lula, I think probably quite uh, mistakenly in some ways. So I think the, the centre lost there. What I think we have at the moment uh, is a bit tentative about this, but I think there is a kind of recomposition of the centre going on. I, can, I think you can see... Two or three, two or three evidence, pieces of evidence for that. I mean, I think in some ways that what's happening with the Centrao is the kind of re-emergence of a kind of a new centre-right in Brazil. And I think, um, picking up on the state governor point, um, I think what you're seeing in, in, in the PT, especially in the Northeast, is the emergence of a whole set of younger governors who are probably shifting gear a bit in terms of uh, a more socially conservative left-wing, centre-left, but socially conservative politics. Uh, they're, they're on four states, the PT governors, and they're very, they're, they're actually quite tough on crime. You know, they're, they're, they're very, um, they're, 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 in some ways, they line up with Bolsonaro in terms of their approach towards crime. And uh, you've seen, for example, in Ceará, you know, big reforms of the prison system, basically instigated by a PT governor. You know, the sort of things that, that, are, that you would expect from the right. So I think there's something there's something going on here. Um, there's a, there's a new generation of politicians on the centre left. Um, the governor of Maranhão, whose name has escaped me, but he's, he's, he's often mentioned in that respect. There are there are new politicians uh, at a local level. I think the governors do have a certain amount of power still. I think you see that if you look at the COVID figures. Um, actually, um, some of the some some states have had a lot more um, success in reducing infection rates because they've 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 they've, they've been cleverer about quarantines and so on and vaccinations than others. Uh, by years done particularly well, and you know Rio's done very very badly. Uh, I mean the death rate in Rio is three times the death rate per, per, per million population is three times nearly that of Bahia. So that's quite quite interesting and does just point to some uh, local political differences. 
Um, I think the, the big question really um, uh, for, for, for Lula is which way is he going to point? I mean, there's, all, there's been, it's early days. Um, uh, there's been all sorts of suggestions that he will sort of move towards the centre and we'll have um, a, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a 2002, you know, 2.0 kind of Lula, where he he, he, he cozies up to people like Mireles, who's, his, remember, was his central bank governor uh, in, in the period between 2002 and 2010. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, at the time, Lula didn't do much on the economy without talking to Mireles first. And that kind of, uh, that kind of deal, I think you can see that as a possibility in the future. Um, but on the other hand, you know, Lula's experience over the past five years has been pretty devastating. And I think he's, you know, um, he's very reluctant to admit that there was anything wrong in what the PT did. Uh, uh, and um, I think we're still, stuff still emerging. I was reading this weekend, I mean, uh, Lula's cabinet chief admitted uh, to Veja magazine that there had been corruption in the PT government. And that there were various people, which he didn't think Lula was responsible for it, but he, there is the beginnings of a kind of potential self-criticism from the PT, which, you know, Lula's certainly not making. He sees himself as a victim of a kind of essentially a kind of, you know, right-wing coup almost. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, and, and in fact, I mean, it, what's been great about this, this discussion has been, uh, despite all the gloom and doom we're seeing in the newspapers, there actually are threads here that all of you have brought up that give some cause for hope, even optimism. And I appreciate that. I think it's, it, it demonstrates again, I mean, you're the one who mentioned that, you know, that Brazil's been in the news and now we associate it with the Amazon and deforestation and other things. But in fact, there's a lot of other stories. Uh, as we know, Brazil is complex, whether at a local uh, level or federal level on the themes. Um, I wanna thank our, our two speakers uh, who had a tremendous insights. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have them on board. Um, I also obviously want to thank Richard uh, and congratulate him on the book. Here's the book. Um, I, can't guarantee, but if you buy a copy, maybe he'll send you a scanned version of his signature so you can have an autographed, virtually COVID autographed, uh, signed copy of his book. Um, but I highly recommend it. Um, and not just because I consulted with him on it, but uh, it's just a good overall analysis of global trends and politics that um, we hope are not a sign of, of the structure of things to come, but certainly reflect uh, more immediate uh, trends that we've seen globally. So again, thanks to BTG Pactual, Fresnillo, HSBC, Karen Energy and Equinor for their support of the Latin American Initiative. Please join me in thanking our two speakers, but in particular, again, Richard, uh, the man of the hour for a, a very good book and a, a sure, truly a labor of love. If anyone knows Richard, they know how much he loves Brazil. Loves it so much he married a Brazilian, in fact. So thank you everyone. I appreciate it and have a good day. Bye-bye. Right.